Jersey's like there's no tomorrow. Um, so anyway, and, and plus the fact that New York's a star for a real basketball team. I mean, the New York Knicks should probably be the New York Knots because it ain't happening. Um, anyway, I mean, it's pretty bad when, and, and forgive me, Nets fans, it's pretty bad when the Nets are the premier team in the tri-state area because the Nets, when I was a kid, the Nets were the biggest joke since the Cleveland Indians, you know. Uh, and I know from some of you, you're like, Cleveland Indians are decent. No, they, when I was a kid, they were, they would lose, consistently lose 95 games a year. I mean, they, that's why they made that movie about it with Charlie Sheen, the, 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 the by winning Tigers blood guy. Anyway. All right, so what, I, what, I, what we're going to do here, I'm going to show you a little bit more. I think we'll watch at least probably about another 20 minutes of this. Uh, again, I want to preface this by saying that this is not my belief. This is not the official story. And, what, um, and I think it's interesting there. I should tell you how controversial this information is, and I preface it that way. Um, what, what this documentary is, is trying to do is they are used, or, or, or we can even debate whether or not this, this film, this piece of work, your media work, is trying to do here, they actually, I want you to pay attention to the sources they use, uh, and, and is it, do you believe it, and, and what argument are they trying to make, and, and you'll see it as it unfolds, but one of the things you have to ask yourself, remember we talked about the five filters, Chom Herman and Chomsky uh, actually called that the propaganda model, but I don't like to call it that because that's not really what propaganda is. I would more call him, the, that's the censorship model, that, that there's an active attempt to censor certain types of information or do stories that make the military look good or, or, or distract people like Jeremy Lind or Whitney Houston or the Grammys and all this stuff. Like now there's this big thing that, and this is why Twitter is bad and emails are bad and texts are bad. When you write a letter to somebody or call somebody on the phone, you'd at least have 10 to 15 seconds before you, somebody would pick up or sometimes a week before someone would get a letter. And at that point in time, you'd be able to calm down. Kanye West, I guess, put some expletive lace tirade on, I didn't even see it, on Twitter about, I guess, the Grammys snubbed him or something stupid like that, or he thought they were dumb. And again, that became like a story, and I'm sitting there going... This because somebody has an anger management issue. This is a, no wait wait no it wasn't Kanye it was Chris Brown sorry sorry don't don't mean to mess up uh, uh, confuse somebody who beats up cameraman with somebody who beats up Rihanna in a two hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini so um, but and the reason why they focused on Chris Brown is partly because of his history and I, I think and this goes back to Whitney Houston I think one of the issues that people have with celebrities is they, they they can't reconcile the reality. Like, I love Michael Jackson's music. Questionable behavior. Questionable person, okay? The Scientology, the hanging around with the kids. What the hell was he doing around hanging around Macaulay Culkin and Webster? Why did he have a monkey? Why did he buy the elephant man's bones? He had a museum to Elizabeth Taylor. He slept in an oxygen chamber. He, he had like 50 different types of plastic surgery to the point where his nose was falling off. It's hard to reconcile that weird crap with... His music, which is absolutely unbelievable to a lot of people. Similar with Whitney Houston. It's hard to reconcile this. But we, and we will talk about this as we go along a little bit more. Um, but again, uh, you know, one of the issues is, do, do those stories distract people? And why, and why do they like delving into this? But the bigger issue is, when those types of things are on the front page of a newspaper, this is not on the front page of a newspaper. And one of the reasons why also that um, newspapers love celebrity stories is, are most celebrity stories controversial in the sense of they touch on things like abortion or gay marriage? Although, Lady Gaga always loves to talk about this kind of stuff. So. But, but here's the thing. What's the difference between Lady Gaga saying something about gay marriage and the President of the United States saying something about gay marriage? Right, Lady Gaga, she's got some symbolic power, and I'm not going to lie to you, but she is not making legislation. It, she could. She could go to California and get a ballot issue, by the way. California of all states in this country, uh, they, there's a battle going on with gay marriage. You'd think in California, uh, uh, especially the home of Hollywood and all the liberal attitude, that this would be the case. But the, the, the people of the state of California actually passed a constitutional amendment to outlaw gay marriage. And then the California Supreme Court just recently overruled it. Um, but again, Lady Gaga could get involved in that fight. But again, she's not on the court. She's not a lawyer and all this other stuff. So for the most part, even when celebrities do talk about Issues. They're either doing like Brad Pitt does stuff for New Orleans uh, with the Hurricane Katrina thing, but in general, they don't 
run for president. Warren Beatty was said he was going to run for president one time. Ronald Reagan did obviously become president, but in, 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 and he was conservative. So, um, but in general, celebrities don't have the power to move things. E even Oprah has limited power. If you see, since she's moved to her new network, her ratings are down, like seriously down. So maybe she should have done. And, and, and I have a hard, high amount of respect for what Oprah does. There ain't no doubt about it. But she does not. She's not going to do anything to stop the national debt or the war in Afghanistan. Now she could do a story on these things, and, and it can add to the news. And one of the aspects is is um, how many people here remember? Remember when I showed you? I had you. I had you look up the Gallup poll data on confidence in, in the news. How many people here think you're confident that the news is giving you the whole story? How many here think that the news hides things constantly? Okay. So what is that? How many people here you you look for other places for information besides news sites? Where do you guys look? Martin? Blogs. So what kind of blogs? Aren't you worried that some that's somebody's opinion? I mean, it's it's better than. Let me put it another way: Do you go read stories on like Yahoo or Google News and then go to the blog, or is that all you do is the blog? Well, I did, I like to get the story and then like look up the story. On what list. kind of stories do you usually uh, click on online? More political stories, I think. So what's? Do you remember the last story you read? Um. Just roughly what it was about. I think yesterday I. I mean, um, so, like the remember. presidential race or something? No, it was um, it was something about how they found like a big. Did you hear about that big whale fish thing that they found like on the side of like some uh, whale? Is whale shark? Yeah, like a whale. Yeah, I remember that story. Why, why did? But but I just thought it looked crazy. It was an interesting story, and the news media loves this stuff, especially. Um, with the advent of visual media, uh, you know, they say a picture, a picture is worth a, th uh, a thousand words. A picture is worth ten million words. Uh, and video is worth a, a quadrillion words. I'm telling you, and I'll tell you right now that most journalists are very, in my opinion, most lower. Unless you're a premier journalist, you are a bad writer, and it's why you're a journalist. If you if you weren't a bad writer, you would write novels, or you would write books, or you would write commentaries, or do something real. If you've ever read a newspaper article, are you impressed with the wording and the writing? I mean, the, and, and one of the issues is, part of it is journalists are, are sort of are, are pressured by space. Part of it is also they're actually told by their editors to dumb things down. We're actually, on, on Tuesday, we're going to do some group exercises where I put you in groups and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you guys each one a, a different uh, media outlet. And, and I'm going to give you a set of stories and, and you're going to have a limited time frame to choose four, what four stories you're going to put on your front page. And we'll see how this works when reality, when, when you're pressured by money. Um, and, and the one thing is, look, the celebrity stories are great. These whale stories are great. You don't need to do a lot of research on them. You don't have to do a lot of context or background in them. And no politician is going to call you up on the phone and go, hey, I saw that story you wrote. First of all, you misquoted me. I mean, is that what you want, right? And you remember, one of the things is the element of official sources. And one of the ways, remember the, the fourth filter was flat, that those who violate the rules. And, and you remember the video I showed you Peter Schiff, I know it was somewhat confusing. But what they were doing to Peter Schiff was attacking him. Um, and, and one of the ways that, that, that you get these people, journalists, to stop writing bad stories about a corporation or a certain politician, or at least to write more, less damaging stories, is to say, you know what, if you write another story like this, Mitt Romney is not going to talk to you anymore. And you won't be invited to his, uh, you know, all this other stuff, you know, the fundraisers or speeches and stuff, or whatever it is. And that's enough to scare most reporters. Because what do you, what do you think most like local reporters make as far as the salary? Basically nothing. I mean, you're talking. If you work for the New York Post, what do you think you make? Fifty thousand a year? Sixty thousand? I mean, let's be realistic about it. What do you think journalists really make? Go ahead. Wait, was that right? What do you think journalists make? What do you think they make a year? Journalists? I'm just guessing. What do you think? As a one month. 40, 45. Let's say, okay, let's say a journalist, three years experience working for the Post, doing stories on politics. How much do they make, do you think? 45. How many people here think they make over $100,000? How many people here think they make uh, fifty to hundred? How many people think they make under fifty thousand? Which, if you make under fifty thousand dollars on Long Island, you're poor. Hey, you're you're are waiting in the bread line. I'm telling you right now. 
Or, or you're at least, I'm telling you, 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 let me put it this way, you're not buying a new Lexus every two years. I can tell you that right now. And you're probably living in some old lady's basement. <clears throat> anyway, or your parents' house. I mean, you're a full-blown, full-time journalist, and you live at mom's house. You know, I mean, that's where you're at. And if, 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 let's say they make $80,000 a year. What's an average politician make, you think? Rick Santorum, who is now the front runner, and, and I, I, when I first saw him in December, actually, I thought that he was the most, he's very good looking, he's smooth, he's from Pennsylvania, people like Midwestern people and, and stuff like that. So his yearly salary, he reported today, was $900,000 a year. And he is, he is the lowest paid of all the candidates. And he got most of that from consulting fees. Mitt Romney, on the other hand, made $21 million. Newt Gingrich made $3 million. The President of the United States is worth about, at least, his net worth is probably 20 to $25 million. Remember, he wrote those two books. He made a lot of money off of those. And when you're the President, you don't spend any money. They buy your food, they, they drive you places. Like, I don't even know why they give him a salary. I'm not sure why. And the salary is only a half a million dollars for the presidency per year. So, if you take someone like Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney makes 40 times the amount that the President makes, yet he still wants the job. And I assure you it's not for the salary. And you should ask yourself that. If somebody doesn't want this job solely because they want to help the country and, and, and sacrifice and all this other stuff, or it's not about the money, uh, or, or at least you know having a salary, then what is it about? It's about power and it's about influence. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, what's interesting is, like, is a $50,000 reporter going to get up in Rick Santorum's face? Some editor that makes $200,000, you think he's going to challenge Rick Santorum? And again, if you do it, you, you want... And, and the bigger issue is, they're, many times they're friends with these people. So they don't want to embarrass these people, and you, and you don't want to lose access. What is funny, one last point about um, Rick Santorum. They were, it was on Bloomberg when they released this. They paid 28% in taxes. So he paid 200 and some thousand dollars in taxes, which to write a $200,000 check to the government, you might find me standing over a bridge going like this. <laughs> Like, I don't know. <clears throat> How high is the Brooklyn Bridge? 200 feet? Don't for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so don't go over to the George Washington Bridge. It's even higher, isn't it? Anyway, I probably shouldn't joke about that. But anyway, um, <laughs> it, it, this would be painful. To, it, and Mitt Romney had to write a $2.5 million check to the government. I mean, I feel bad when i got to give him $100. You know, I mean, my gosh. But they were trying to make Rick Santorum out to be the the people's candidate, because he only made $900,000 a year, and I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know a lot of people who make $900,000 a year there, Ricky, so um, I'm not impressed with your credentials as a middle class person. Now, he made a lot less when he was younger, but I'm going to tell you something right now. Who here thinks somebody who makes $900,000 a year is poor? Thank you. I mean, if you, you think of... Anyway, it's good to, good to have comedy. Um, anyway, you know what? You know what's even even worse is when politicians say stuff like it's you know. And it's it, the sad thing is that's actually true that Rick Santorum is the, the most middle class person. They asked John McCain in two thousand and eight. I mean, he's considered middle class. No, oh, Mike McCain. No, Rick Santorum. Yeah. That's considered. As a candidate, yeah. Oh. All of them. All of them. They, uh, other than Mitt Romney, all of them will tell you they're middle class. Well, it's <laughs> all of them telling you at least. I, and, 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 and Mitt said some stupid things recently, especially about very poor people. But, but I'll tell you, I'll give him credit on this. At least he's not trying, like all the rest of these millionaires, to try and just deliberately lie to the American people and say, I'm just like you. You're not just like me. You don't go to the grocery store. You don't clean your house. You don't even pay your own bills. You don't worry about where your money's coming from. Other people go shopping for your clothes. You have security guards around you all the time. People kiss your ass constantly. <laughs> no one's going to fire you. They don't tell me you're like me. You know, I mean, this is seriously nonsense. The, the, but politicians even do things worse than that. John McCain, who actually did grow up middle class and was a jet fighter pilot in Vietnam and spent six years in a prisoner war camp, uh, and he still can't stand the sound of jingling keys, which when he was running for president, I was, I was going to offer the Obama administration to go to his rallies and jingle keys and make him real nervous. But that was kind of, I thought that might be cruel. But anyway, but that's politics. Um, but they asked him, he's married to a, 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 billion, or a, mil, a multimillionaire. I can't remember her name. And it's his second wife, too. Um, and, and his daughter's kind of a nut, if you've ever seen her. Uh, she's about 19 or 20. Uh, she writes this stuff up. She likes Twitter. She puts a lot of 
she was accused of putting racy photos and stuff. But when you look like that, you know, any photo is almost racy. You know, it's like when you look like Raquel Welch, there's no non-racy photos of you, even if you're 62. You know, anyway, which is about how old she is. Um, but they asked John McCain, "How many houses do you have?" And he said, "I don't know." Wrong answer, McFly. <laughs> Seriously, I mean that. I remember when I heard that, I was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" I mean, most the poor people just want to take him and snap him in half. I'm like, how dare you have so, you have so many houses you can't even count? I mean, my God! And it came out later they had 15 houses. The absurdity that these politicians try to pretend like they're just like you. They're not just like you. If they don't get elected, they go back to their McMansion and they sit around their their eight foot wide screen TV. And maybe they cry over a bottle of five hundred dollar wine and, 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 and pet their two thousand dollar dog and, and and hang out with their third or fifth wife or whatever and talk to their kids and spoil them rotten and, and then tell their kids, when you run for president, I want you to punish the American people for treating your dad like this. Anyway. Um, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, it's just absurdity what goes on, and, and people get suspicious that the system is gained. Uh, we actually talked about my intro class about this stuff, about how money and politics uh, impacts this stuff. So, but let's go back to this. But I want to ask you one simple question. What's the difference between propaganda and news? Like, for example, Hitler was accused of propaganda, and the government was accused of propaganda during the Iraq War and stuff. What's the difference between propaganda and, like, a documentary or, or a news story? You may tell me. Right. So in a news story, it's supposed to be somewhat objective, and if there are two, three sides of a story, like if you do a story about gay marriage, you got to give equal weight to both sides. You can't go and the opponents of gay marriage who are stupid, right? You can't say stuff like that. But in a commentary or a, a, a propaganda piece, is all propaganda evil for evil purposes? You got to think about this. A presidential candidate running a commercial that says "Vote for me" and this is why isn't that a form? It's in a form of advertisement, but it's a form of like what people might term positive propaganda, because it doesn't necessarily. Here's here's a, here's one of the main differences between maybe what you would call good propaganda, where it has a purpose of using the truth in a selective way to promote something, whereas there's other propaganda that uses falsehoods, you know, a lot of falsehoods and a little bit of truth in the middle. To construct a story that doesn't exist, like JFK. Anybody ever seen this movie? Nobody's seen JFK? You gotta go out and see this, seriously. It's about the Kennedy, this conspiracy around the Kennedy assassination. Okay? Let me put it this way Is there any direct, hard evidence that John Kennedy was killed by the CIA or, or by the Cubans or by the Mafia? No. I mean, right now, the official story is still that Lee Harvey Oswald killed him. Now, some of the things they leave out is Lee Harvey Oswald was a CIA agent. He also defected to the Soviet Union in the early 19, in the early, the late 1950s. And if you know anything, was it the habit of the United States government in the 1950s to let people back in who had defected to Russia, married a Russian woman, and professed communist beliefs? Is that normal that they just let you back in? Isn't that a little odd that somebody who went to the Soviet Union and married a Russian woman just was able to come back into the country and live like nothing happened? So maybe that's evidence. But other than that, does, is there any evidence as another gunman? Because that's a conspiracy, isn't it? Okay. But JFK itself is a form of propaganda that takes little bits of facts and then adds a whole bunch of assumptions. So I want you, while we're watching this, to see if this is what's happening here. And tell me as well whether or not... You know, what this makes you feel about your government is this correct or whatever. So here we go. So here we're going back. Far from here, a passerby found the passport of one of the hijackers. How does a RSP fly out of a man's pocket through a 400 mile per hour airplane crash? You guys, survive 9,000 gallons of jet fuel and land intact on a sidewalk a thousand feet below. Let me rewind this because it's American mainstream media, 57 video tour, and flight manual. An Arab English dictionary, a handheld flight computer, a Quran, and his will. Why would Ada take his will onto a plane that would be destroyed in a fiery inferno? Marwan al-Shahi's rental car, 
discovered at Logan Airport, containing an Arabic flight manual, an airport restricted area pass, and documents from Hoffman Aviation. Nawaf Al Hazmi's rental car, discovered at Dulles Airport, containing Mohammed Atta's instructions, a check for a flight school in Phoenix, four drawings of a 757 cockpit, a knife, and maps of Washington and New York. Satam Al Sakami's passport. It came out later in the 9 11 report the hijackers. Well, Dan, not far from there, a passerby found the passport of one of the hijackers. How does a passport fly out of a man's pocket through a 400 mile per hour airplane crash? survive 9,000 gallons of jet fuel, and land intact on a sidewalk a thousand feet below. Mine's already starting Mahed to Mahed and Nawaf Al-Hazmi's ID cards discovered in the wreckage at the Pentagon. An ID, Saeed Al-Gandhi's passport, Ahmed Al-Nami's driver's you license, think this is, you think this is passport gonna survive a jet fuel fire? Stay and a business plastic. card found in Shanksville. I can put a magnifying the glass on this and burn it. A former high-level intelligence official so there's a lot of, commented they, to New York there's a lot of evidence here that's unexplained. Whatever trail was left was yeah. left deliberately for the FBI to chase. They used hundreds of different pay phones and cell phones, often with prepaid calling cards that are extremely difficult to trace. And they made sure that all the money sent to them... So now this guy's trying to explain why we could catch the in small amounts to avoid detection. Small amounts. Lieutenant General Mahmoud Ahmed, the director of the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, the ISI, was reported to have wired $100,000 to the Muhammad guy that's Adam hiding in August 2001. This transfer was facilitated by Saeed Sheikh, the man who allegedly kidnapped and murdered Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl, who is investigating the ties between the ISI and Islamic militants. And Pakistanis, of course, if you know your history, have only been a couple of degrees of separation away from the so-called Al-Qaeda hijackers. There are no degrees. The ISI has had a long-standing relationship with the Central Intelligence Agency, dating back to the 1980s with the establishment of so the United States in Afghanistan. The CIA, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, and the Al-Qaeda were all in on this. I focus in on the wire transfer that General Mahmoud Ahmed wired to Muhammad Atta right before 9-11. That's pretty crucial because General Mahmoud Ahmed was actually meeting with key Washington, D.C. insiders, Senator Bob Graham, Porter Goss, the future director of CIA, on the morning of 9-11. And he has a relationship not only with the CIA, but with Dick Armitage at State Department, Mark Grossman at State Department. Yes. Are, you, are you aware of the reports at the time that ISI chief was in Washington on September 11 and on September 10? $100,000 was wired from Pakistan to these groups here in this area. And why he was here, was meeting with you or anybody in the administration? Um, I have not seen that report and he was certainly not meeting with me. Yes? In the White House transcript of this exchange, which is delivered to the press, the information about the ISI is censored. Bob Graham and Porter Goss will later co-head a joint inquiry which publicly claims that the Bush administration received absolutely no intelligence that could have prevented the attacks. The meeting begins at 8 a.m. over breakfast at the Capitol building and lasts through Flight 175's impact with the South Tower. During his visit, which began on September 4th, Ahmed would also meet with the present CIA director, George Tenet. A month later, stuff after reports afterwards. of the transfer between himself and Ada, Mahmoud Ahmed retires from the ISI. The 9-11 Commission Not report convenient. will later conclude that they saw no evidence that any foreign government or foreign government official supplied any funding. The Commission decided not only to omit the information, Think about the reality but to deny Pakistan was behind the 9-11 attack. Uh, That's a nuclear power. Report, the We're supposed to be our okay. ally? You said, quote, Pakistan? the U.S. government has not been able to determine the origin of the money used in the 911 attacks. Ultimately, the question is of little practical significance, end quote. How can you state that the question of who bankrolled the deaths of 3,000 American people on September 11th is, quote, of little practical significance? Because it costs so little money. That's the awful thing. It costs less than $500,000. That's why it's so hard to trace.
we were able to find. Dude, you're not answering the question. But you in very small pieces. And you said, what if our CIA chief had funneled money into terrorists in Afghanistan? No. That a hundred thousand was wired to Muhammad Atta directly from the head of Pakistani Hassan. Well, I'm not aware of one hundred thousand dollars. The uh, Pakistan, I think, is the most dangerous. <sighs> you heard Why was there such a vested interest in covering up the transaction between the ISI and Muhammad Atta? And let's talk about that wire transfer because uh, Governor Kane had no basis for denial because the FBI and the Wall Street Journal confirmed the General Mahmoud Ahmed wire transfer I'm talking about. But the 9 11 Commission deliberately said that funding is not important and assigning blame is not important to them. But it is to us. As if their funding was not suspicious enough, a number of hijackers reportedly trained at U.S. military bases. As hard as this is to believe that two of the alleged terrorists this involved is a new in what happened on Tuesday may have attended schools run by the U.S. military. Now this is according to a senior defense official. Ahmed al Nami, Ahmed al Gandhi, and Saeed al Gandhi listed their address on both driver's licenses and car registrations as the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. Muhammad Adi reportedly graduated from the U.S. International Office School at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. In response to a Freedom of Information Act, Captain Jason Taylor confirmed that a Muhammad Atta trained there between 1998 and 1999, but did not verify if it was the same person. You don't have a picture of him? Somebody trained on your at base, Louis you don't have a picture? Alamari attended Come on. Brooks Air Force Base in San Antonio. It wasn't the same guy who released the picture. Saeed al -Gandhi and others attended the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, as confirmed by Lieutenant Colonel Steve Butler, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. American media ceases investigation when the Air Force says, we are probably not talking about the same people. Two of the hijackers, Release the Nawaz al Hazmi and Khalid al Madar, rented and an Every military official or person, person on a base has an ID. With their picture on Curiously, a number of them were reported to still be alive after the attack. That was a real news Finally, story. We were led to believe that the alleged hijackers were fundamentalist Muslims spending their final days preparing for paradise. Yet, in the week before the attacks, a number of them would drink, visit strip clubs, and solicit prostitutes. By all accounts, Ada and his and none of them were themselves in their life, except none of them were for last about Thursday Muslim. at this bar in Hollywood, Florida. It's believed both men came in, drank heavily, and then refused to pay the bill. And the guy got like very, very offended, and he, he said to me, he said, oh, I can pay my bill, I'm, a, I'm an airline pilot. And I was like, okay. Mahed Maket is spotted several times at a porn shop. Hamza Al Gandhi ordered a porno in his hotel on September 10th. What was the title? <laughs> the mayor of Patterson, New Jersey, states that they are spotted more at go-go clubs than at mosques. Regardless of their actions, some of the hijackers so presence they weren't Muslim was known extremists, as well, early as 2000. They? What did we know? When did we know it? That's what some congressmen are asking now, and asking quite loudly. Did we know the year before 9-11 that one of the hijackers was a terrorist threat? Army Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schiffer has gone the CIA public with his charge that Able Danger, a military intelligence project he worked with in 2000, identified Mohammed Atta, even pulled up his picture along with three other 9-11 hijackers as possible Al-Qaeda members. We found the identities of four of the 9-11 hijackers prior to 9-11. But he says beginning in September 2000, three meetings he set up with the FBI were each canceled by military lawyers. Yes. Schaefer also says he remembers telling then 9-11 commission staff at a meeting in Afghanistan about Atta and what the intelligence unit found back in 2000. And he was surprised that it did not show up in the commission's report. I'm told confidently uh, by the person who did move the material over, that the 9 11 Commission received two briefcase size containers of documents. I can tell you for a fact that would not be one one twentieth of the information that the Able Danger consisted of during the time we spent. A 9 11 Commission spokesman said nothing they got from the Pentagon in early 2004 backed up Schaefer's claim, quote, none of the documents turned over to the Commission mentioned Mohammed Atta or any of the other future hijackers. Where is it? Where's the beef? Where's the substance? Where is this mysterious chart that 
purportedly says that Otto was connected in some real way to these other hijackers. We'd love to see it. The company responsible for the chart, Orion Scientific Systems, would claim that only two charts were produced and that Otto was not present on either one. Throw them all out, John. These are all the charts. Spread them out. These are all the charts, all the connections that they had. These charts were all done by the data mining efforts. So the Orion Corporation lied to the Senate Judiciary Committee staff. All data mining efforts, and yet the company said to the Senate Judiciary staff, we don't have any of those charts. They're not ours. Well, here they are. And their logos are on each one of them. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, at least two of the five people that were going to appear today were threatened with removal of their security clearances if they continue to talk about this. This is going to be liberty to identify who those two are. Uh, I will to you. I'd rather do it privately since the Defense Department has chosen not to allow anyone to testify, but I will provide that information to the committee. For the life of me, uh, I don't understand here. why. Uh, as I understand it, I stand corrected if I'm wrong. Vice President. I understand the witnesses we assumed we were going to get to hear from from the Defense Department have been pulled. They may be or may not be in the room, but have been instructed that they cannot testify. Um, I think that's a big mistake. This is actually a chart of Al Qaeda and the various cells around the world. Much of this data, most of it, was obtained prior to 9/11 by the work of Able Danger. Uh, as you see, there is an actual photograph what of Muhammad. Does that, what does that depict generally? It depicts the uh, organizational and activity associations of Al-Qaeda operatives that were involved in 9-11 and related events. And at the time, if the Commission had looked into this in early 2004, the charts that had Muhammad Atta on it still existed. There was a chart in Mr. Smith's office. There was the chart that still should have been in the Defense Intelligence Agency because it wasn't destroyed uh, within Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer's files until the spring of 2004. The same with the chart that Mr. Smith had. When the news story uh, started to come out became severely it. restricted and then ultimately shut down due to intelligence oversight concerns. I was supported vigorously by both the LIWA and the INSCOM chain of commands. Uh, and we actively worked to overcome this shutdown for the next several months. In the midst of this shutdown, I, along with one of my analysts, Chief, uh, Chief Warrant Officer 3, Terry Stevens, were forced to destroy all data, charts, and other analytical products that we had not already passed on to so hearing. Another former DOD official to 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 will to testify to. today that he was ordered to destroy up to 2.5 terabytes of data. Now, I don't know what a terabyte of data is, so we contacted the Library of Congress. It's equal to one-fourth of all the entire written collection that the Library of Congress maintains. Uh, are you in a position to uh, evaluate the credibility of uh, Captain Philpott, Colonel Schaefer, uh, Mr. Westfall, Mr. Preissler, Mr. J.D. Smith, as to their uh, credibility when they say they saw Muhammad Anna on the chart? Uh, yes, sir. I believe them uh, implicitly. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, who was the first member of Able Danger to go public, has now been told in writing by the Defense Intelligence Agency that he can't speak to members of Congress or their staff without prior approval. And now a security clearance, which allowed him to deal with classified information, has been pulled. The congressman says Schaefer if has been gagged, if he's, if he's punished. If he's not hitting on something up. sensitive, then why are they doing this? The official response to able danger began in September You only start to claim down on somebody when you're scared of what they're going to say. Commissioner Slade Gordon to Senator Arlen Specter. Gordon concludes by saying that since Condoleezza Rice, President Bush, and the White House denied that Able Danger identified the 9-11 hijackers, it never happened. A six-month investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee concluded in December 2006 that Able Danger did not identify Muhammad Atta or any other 9-11 hijacker. Can we be certain that the hijackers were radical Muslims on a suicide mission? Or is there a possibility that they were trained, funded, and protected in our own country. Here's their main thesis, right here. And this is where the controversy is. Yes, ma'am, Sergeant Lord. Yes, I'm just letting you know for information we're having an exercise, SF exercise. Okay, I'm out. Okay. Guys, happy thing. All right, thank you. The Defense Department was conducting war games on Between September 11th. Between 2000 and June 2001, the Federal Aviation Administration FAA would scramble fighter jets to intercept errant aircraft 67 times. Interceptions are routine and usually occur within 10 minutes of a sign of trouble, and yet they such as the permanently the losing Pentagon, radio contact and transponder signal or flying off course. On the morning of September 11, that second one was according to official accounts, four commercial aircraft would be off course and out of communication, 
and not one of them would be intercepted. Although How people claim that Flight 93 That was. on four separate occasions, on one day... This is a congresswoman, not that some fruitcake who doesn't know what she's A trillion dollar military and intelligence infrastructure could fail. I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center, no, take another one and like slam that. it into the Pentagon. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings well, now you're the Clintons. on such a massive scale. That turns out not to be true. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. As reported by U.S. Agents, the Secretary North American Aerospace Defense Secretary Secretary State State North State conducted flying. exercises with fighter jets, simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attacks. Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. According to this April 2001 Pentagon email, Air Force officials wanted a war game having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon. The idea was to check response times to launch fighter jets, but according to the Pentagon email, the plan was ultimately rejected by senior Pentagon officials as too unrealistic. Still to come are questions, big questions, about Norad's response on the day of the attack. Why, despite all the exercises and the planning, Peter, jet fighters were not in place anywhere near New York or Washington. It's been an amazing story. Many thanks, Brian. Brian Ross. One drill, called Amalgam Virgo, was conducted on June 1st and 2nd, 2001, and simulated successful terrorist attacks. Its purpose was to focus on unconventional threats including an airborne hijacking. One plan would simulate the hijacking of a commercial airliner, which would be crashed into the capital. The second part of the exercise, which was planned but not executed before 9-11, involved two planes with actual pilots on the flight deck. FBI agents would hijack the planes and divert them to secure locations. And on its cover, Osama bin Laden. In fact, Multiple war games were underway on 9-11 itself. The question was, we had four war games going on on September 11th, and the question that I tried to pose before the uh, secretary had to go to lunch was um, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks. The answer to the question is no, it did not impair our response. In fact, uh, Jim Leberhardt, who was in the commander of North American Aerospace... Of course Defense, it didn't, because then it would mean I wasn't doing my job. You think I'm going to admit that? Uh, and people regularly lie to Congress. I think that shouldn't be any surprise to you. Barry Bonds did it and didn't do a day of time. So if they're not going to throw Barry Bonds in jail, do you think they're going to send Donald Rumsfeld to jail for obstructing justice or perjury? You cannot run a government when government officials are allowed to go up in front of Congress, take the oath, and just lie. You can't run a government like that. You can't run a government with the CIA doing things where the public is unable to see what they're doing. The bigger issue is here, so what kind of evidence were they using? Were they making stuff up? What kind of evidence were they using? And is this propaganda versus a, a, a documentary? So, what kind of evidence were they using? What were they using? Martin Grace Women, CIA. Okay, but, but where were they getting this information from? They showed that actually talking the people in the government. Alright, what else did they use? Written evidence, like written paperwork. Right, so government stuff, what else? There's one last piece, which I think gives it a lot of credibility and, and connects us to what we're talking about with the book. News stories. News stories. For mainstream play, CNN. Do you think all you all you know of Fox News? Do you think Fox News wanted to make the Bush administration look bad? But they put those stories out. Do this. Let me put it. Does the evidence call into question the official story, or not? 
Did the government investigate this properly? No. Or did they did they hide things from the American public? Almost hiding them in plain sight? What kind of things did they hide? What did they what did they were gonna take away that guy's security clearance for? Because he said what? Because he had evidence that the hijackers had done what? They had like identified them before. Not only that, but that they had trained at US military bases. Nobody finds that strange? That doesn't bother anybody? That terrorists who killed 3,000 Americans appear to have trained at U.S. military bases? And also, this, it doesn't bother anybody that the head of the Pakistani intelligence service wired $100,000 to the main head of the, of the hijacking team, Muhammad Atta, and that the U.S. government threw that away like it wasn't even evidence? Did you hear what that one guy said, Pac Thomas, Thomas Kane, the former governor of Jersey? He said, Pakistan is the most dangerous country on earth. Are we, did we attack at Pakistan? And I mentioned this before, what's one of the main reasons why we're not going to ever attack Pakistan directly? It's a nuclear weapon, yeah. That's right. And plus, I assure you, India is not very happy, would not want the United States invading a country that doesn't like them either. Pakistan and India, you, we don't even know how close they are to war, but I would tell you, first of all, they're fighting over the Kashmir region regardless. But every single day, they're probably this close to war. They're probably closer to war than Israel and Iran are. Pakistan and India cannot stand each other. I mean, it is, it is, a, it is an unbelievably tense, uh, tense relationship. The only thing that stopped it for a while was the earthquake in the Kashmir region. Martin, are you, are you from that region? Or, or no? What? You're not from... No. <laughs> well, I just want... Because you, you, you're giving me information about it, so anyway. Um, but, again, I think one of, what's clear here is that there was a lot of information left out of the official reports. The newspapers engaged in a form of either censorship or omission. And even though after the fact, remember I read that late is too late. So this is what I want you to do. Since, I, since some of you probably don't enjoy this type of uh, material, and some of you probably have relatives or maybe know people that died in 9-11, and you don't, that's why I'm not going to show this whole thing. I will give you guys an opportunity to watch this whole thing as extra credit and write up a one-page report or whether or not did this alter your views because one of the ideas that we have in the media is that the media content can change your opinion about things, right? Someone says something stupid, you're not going to vote for them. Uh, somebody writes a story about uh, a company abusing its workers, maybe you don't shop there. Tell me, did this change your view or, 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 or not? Or do you think it's just garbage? And use evidence in there, okay? And there's no right or wrong answer. There's no, I'm not going to go wrong. It, it, it does change everything. Yes? I just have a question. What do you think about their passports being found on the ground? Yeah, I find that really, really, really strange. That looks like a plant to me. Yeah, um, it, which, if, if, here's the problem. If that's, if it's, there, I'm not saying that that couldn't have happened. But the likelihood that, and, and the hijackers were in the front of the plane. They were the first ones to hit the building. That's where the explosion and if you've ever if you've ever seen anything slow motion where they ever seen a bullet go into an apple slow motion, that, that's probably what that airplane did to that building. That the and the airplanes are made of fiberglass essentially and with a metal skeleton uh, underneath it and and they're light as hell. That's why they fly and they're and they're hollow like like bird's wings and, and when they hit they're going to explode uh, and the and the front's going to come off and everything. And it, it, do you really think that some piece of paper stuck in somebody's pocket? Or uh, The only thing I can think is the only way it would have survived is maybe it was in the luggage. And the luggage fell down. But here's the other thing. I, this is evidence I want. Did you find any other people's passports? That's the issue. Then I'm willing to believe it. But I'm telling you right now, my passport, which I got in 2002, which, man, i got to renew that thing. Anyway, um, and I love it because it's got stamps with whales and Amsterdam. And Anyway, um, and but my the binding is already starting to come off of it, you know. And and, and again, I will show you this, this little plastic. Look at this thing. That's not going to survive anything, okay? Um, but it's just odd. 
Uh, and and it, it, let's just postulate for one moment that it's true that somebody planted their passports down there. and sin First of all, they had to singe them and make them look like they got on fire. But what, what does that suggest? That there's an alt there's a, there was another person on the ground that knew that it was going to happen and was waiting around until it happened and then went into the, the blast zone and dropped the stuff off. That seems a little far-fetched. What's more likely the truth is it was in his luggage. And maybe the luggage was in one of the top compartments and the compartments blew out. Uh, that's completely... Because you'd think the back part of the plane would have started exploding and pieces would have started coming off of it. Um, but again, one of, I didn't even get to some of the evidence. They showed repeated eyewitnesses said that it sounded like a bomb went off. That when the buildings came down. But can anybody explain to me with, with an alternative explanation other than a bomb why it might have sounded like explosions were happening as the building was collapsing? Well, also, aren't the windows going to bust out? I mean, you ever heard you ever heard a window bust out of a car? Because the heat's like, boom! I mean, it is an explosion. It's not something little. And, and you, if you ever saw, did anybody ever go to the World Trade Center before it fell down? How big were the windows? They were enormous, like this, you know, and, and they were thick. And that type of pressure, it, it would be pow, pow. It, you know, remind me of the little bubble wrap things. You smack them things, or, or just um, take a, pee, a plastic bag and... and, and put air in it and smack it, it sounds like an explosion. So, but again, but the problem was the government, instead of really dealing with these issues, like the Pakistani security officer or the fact that some of these hijackers' names had appeared on attendance roles at U.S. military bases and the idea that the eyewitnesses hear an explosion, the problem is when you don't deal with those things, what, what starts to happen with them? What starts to happen with these ideas? When the government doesn't deal with them or starts to deny them or starts to pressure people. What, what then starts to happen in people's minds? People start to think it's corrupt. Yeah, it's a cons then the conspiracy, it's like a little seed and now the conspiracy grows. And what do you think would happen, if, what do you think, how do you think the American people would, re would react if they found out that their government perpetrated a crime against 3,000 people to start a war in Afghanistan so they could build a pipeline? from Uzbekistan, which is what the film accuses them of doing because the, the Unical company that, that negotiated the pipeline with the Taliban, the Taliban refused to allow the pipeline to go through Afghanistan. Guess who we attacked right after 9-11? The Taliban. Here's what's also I find funny. We spent more time attacking the Taliban than Al-Qaeda. Isn't that weird? The Taliban, the only thing they had to do with Al-Qaeda was supporting them. Al-Qaeda was the real criminals. And it took 10... We got Saddam Hussein seven years before we got the Laden. Martin, do you want to add something? I was going to say, I think that's just the hardest part to believe, at least for me personally. That what? It, that it was just, I mean, all orchestrated because... Right, it seems very far-fetched. It seems ridiculous. But isn't that... If you were going to do something like that, isn't that exactly what you'd want? Well, yeah. That, like the JFK assassination. They... This is what this is what you do when when someone comes across a, a, a fantastic fantasy. What you what you do is what we call the fantasy land defense. You get up in front of Congress. This is exactly what was done during the Iran Contra affair when the CIA was dealing was allowing Nicaraguan uh, military officials to sell crack in Los Angeles to fund, which came out to be true later. What you do is you go, come on, do you really think the United States government would hijack its own planes? and run them into buildings and kill thousands of Americans and start a global war on terror just to build a pipeline? Come on, man. But isn't that exactly how you could cover it up, too? By saying, come on. Nobody would do that. I'm a patriot. I would never do that. But let me ask you something. Has your government in the past killed thousands of people without any hint of anything wrong? Remember the peanut butter scandal with the salmonella? That killed people. Did the government stop that? They could have. The government knew for years that smoking was killing 440,000 people a year. Did they do anything about that? What did the government say about tobacco for a long time? A long time. What did they say? Two, two main things. You guys don't remember? One, it wasn't addictive. And two, it doesn't cause cancer. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So again, what I want to do for that assignment.
assignment, it, 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 it's an optional assignment, just do that for me. I want to move though, because this isn't the only example of when this occurs with the media. I want to move back to talk about the economic crisis and some of the stock issues. So we're going to, I'm going to show you a piece uh, with Jim Cramer. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. No, it's all right. With Jim Cramer and John Stewart.